The Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University is honored to be a supporter of Indian Country Today. ASU offers the only online undergraduate digital media literacy degree, teaching students how to recognize and combat inaccuracies on all platforms. They are using cutting-edge tools and tactics to separate fact from fiction in a digital world overloaded with misinformation. Learn more at cronkite.asu.edu. is Indian Country Today. Esquili, yes, eh. Thank you for joining us. I'm Patty Tawahungba. Here are the headlines from Indian Country Today. Rick Santorum is no longer employed by CNN after making disparaging and ignorant remarks about Native Americans. The former CNN contributor reduced the influence of Native Americans on U.S. history while speaking at an event last month, saying there isn't much Native American culture in American culture. Allison Rudnick, vice president of CNN's Diversity and Inclusion, confirmed with Axios that it has parted ways with Santorum. The pundit tried to explain away his comments, saying he misspoke and that he was not trying to dismiss Native Americans. CNN's split with Santorum follows pressure from indigenous-led groups who called on the network to fire the former senator. The news network also found itself in hot water during its election coverage when it put Native Americans into a category called something else. One of the only Native American-owned banks in the country is getting $10 million in funding support for loans. Bank of America teamed up with the Native American Bank based in Denver, Colorado, to help give more loan opportunities for tribes. The loan is part of the Payment Protection Program. Tom Ogard is president of the bank, and he explains how this loan can help Native communities. The ability to make loans to tribes or their tribal economic entity is extremely important because it does a couple of things. It, it brings jobs to a community where the unemployment rate for uh, Native Americans is the highest among any minority group in the country by far. So it brings jobs. It also sustains jobs that are out there. So I think, it, and it also brings hope to uh, the people that are there. The bank has more than 52% of Native American employees with plans to expand to at least six different locations by 2023. A Native family in Lincoln, Nebraska is filing a lawsuit against school officials because their children's hair was cut without their permission. This happened back in the spring of 2020 when two employees cut the children's hair during a head lice check. The family is Lakota and they believe their hair should only be kept long and it's a sacred symbol of their life. They say hair should only be cut under specific circumstances and by select individuals. Their lawsuit argues that by cutting the student's hair without consent, school officials violated the family's First Amendment right. The American Civil Liberties Union of Nebraska says the whole situation could have been avoided if the school had followed written policy and respected the family's belief. The lawsuit asks the court to find the school violated the student's rights and award damages as it sees fit. Homeless shelters in Seattle, Washington that serve Native people are rethinking their contracts with the city. Homeless outreach agencies like Native-led Chief Seattle Club contract with the city's Human Services Department. Publicola.com reports these agencies argue the new requirements would harm its relationships with clients and give new power to the city. These new rules require agencies to drop whatever outreach, outreach they are doing to provide services to homeless camps in the city. The Native community in King County, which includes Seattle, makes up just 1% of the population. But according to a count done in 2020, American Indians make up 15% of the homeless population there. That's more than 1,700 homeless Native Americans. The Seattle Indian Health Board says that by prioritizing camps, American Indian and Alaska Native people will be excluded as they do not typically stay in homeless camps. The board is one of seven outreach providers that signed a letter last month saying they would not sign their new contracts in its current form. There's no word on whether the Human Service, uh, Services Department is willing to negotiate terms of a new contract. 
After hearing a report that hundreds of bison in the Grand Canyon National Park were going to be killed, Lakota chef Sean Sherman took action. Sherman, who founded the indigenous foods team, The Sioux Chef, launched a change.org petition asking the National Park Service to halt plans for a lethal culling of the bison herd. The petition reached more than 22,000 signatures before it was closed. After sending a letter about the culling, the chef was able to speak with leaders from the National Park Service. And he learned that the report was wrong and that 12, not hundreds, of bison were going to be killed by skilled volunteers. He says it was that wording of the report and the history of bison killings that triggered him to act. How damaging that was to so many tribes, you know, because, you know, I'm Oglala and there's a lot of stories of what happens when the bison start to disappear and the struggles that really come up within our indigenous communities, you know, so um, those kinds of words are really triggering. Sherman is hoping to develop a relationship with the Park Service to begin offsetting some of the costs of delivering bison to tribes that want them. The Oklahoma Movie Hall of Fame is announcing its 2021 inductees and this year includes one very special person to Indian country. Muskogee Creek actor Will Sampson rocketed to fame in the movie One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and he will be posthumously inducted into the Hall of Fame. Sampson appeared in more than 70 films and television shows and was also a painter and rodeo performer. He was on the rodeo circuit when producers of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest were looking for a large Native American for the film. Before this role, Sampson had never acted before. The induction ceremony will take place at Muskogee, Oklahoma's historic Roxy Theater on May 29th. And those are the headlines from Indian Country Today. I'm Patty Tholahungva. A sacred site in Hawaii is getting attention by the state legislature. We'll hear more when we come back. To Native Hawaiians, Mauna Kea is sacred. It's a very special place. Scientists agree and want to see the 30 meter telescope built there. Before the pandemic, up to 30,000 people camped and protested against the construction of that telescope. The Hawaiian state legislature has established a working group to discuss how the site is managed. Three of its members are leading the protest movement. House Speaker Scott Sakai joins us now to talk about the House resolution Welcome, Speaker Psyche. Hi, thanks. Thanks for having me today on your show. How did the, maybe start with a broad description of the issues as you see it. Sure, so, you know, the uh, astronomy issue dates back to the 1960s when the governor at that time worked with the community on the big island, the island of Hawaii, to create an astronomy program. And as a part of that, the state of Hawaii issued a master lease to the University of Hawaii for the university to manage uh, Mauna Kea, including the summit of Mauna Kea, where you now have 13 um, telescopes that have been built there. Um, so over the years, since 1968, um, you know, there has been more concern about the management of Mauna Kea. The lease is a 65 year lease. So it is set to expire in the year 2033. And at that point, the state will have to make a decision on whether or not to continue the lease, the master lease with the University of Hawaii or find another way of, of managing Mauna Kea. How did the legislature, um, how is it resolving this? Yeah, so um, about a year prior to the pandemic, uh, about a year and a half ago, the Department of Land and Natural Resources, which um, manages public land in the state of Hawaii, brought on a consultant to do an evaluation of Mauna Kea and how it's being managed. And the consultant um, held scoping meetings throughout, throughout the state uh, for almost uh, a year, and then produced a report in December, 2020. And basically the consultant made two findings. One was that the university had had somewhat improved its management ability over Mauna Kea. But the second finding was even more important, which was that the university had failed to um, manage uh, cultural, cultural resources, uh, education uh, on Mauna Kea. And it was the second finding, it was that second finding 
uh, of the university's inability to manage culture uh, that caused the House of Representatives to um, adopt a resolution that creates a working group. And it's the purpose of this working group is to uh, form a 15 member committee that will work over this summer and this fall and propose a new management and governance structure for Mauna Kea. So much of this um, issue comes down to kind of a broken trust between different parties. Uh, do you see a way to build consensus for going forward? I mean, I, I hope so. I, I, I think that um, there are, you know, with an issue like this, you just have uh, polar extremes within the community. Um, so that is something that we know that we will be facing. But the purpose of this committee was to bring together diverse groups um, that would, you know, work to forge some consensus on how to manage, how to better manage Mauna Kea. So, you know, seven of our seven of the fifteen seats on our of, on our working group were reserved for for Native Hawaiian um, individuals, and so three of those seats were uh, actually um, does it, uh, were were given to three of the leaders from the Kia'i uh, community on the Big Island. The Kia'i group is the group that took the lead in um, organizing protests at Mauna Kea over the last few years. Uh, but three of its leaders, its top leaders, are on our working group. This is such an international issue as well as one impacting local communities. Uh, how do you think the world sees this and how does that help or hurt this conversation go forward? Yes, I think I think that the international community and you know uh, the thirty meter telescope uh, proposal is an, is an international project. There's a a, a, a number of of, of other na nations that are involved in that project, and everybody's watch everyone is watching this. But I think part of the reason why is because some of these nations themselves are facing similar issues, um, you know, with, within their countries. Canada, for example, is facing. Um, similar kinds of concerns and protests. And um, so I think that this is, this really, the way that we handle the Mauna Kea issue, the way that we manage it, I think will we'll create, could create an international model for how to try to resolve these kinds of cultural differences. One of those cultural di differences involves uh, the scientific community and um, how, how do you bring folks who are hard on the science saying this or no other way into a, a civic discussion, I guess, is really what it boils down to? Yes, yeah, so I think that over the past few years, the um, astronomers and the scientists who are uh, involved with the astronomy program in Hawaii have had um, have experience of a, a, a seismic wake up call. And they understand, they understand that they cannot just view this from the lens of, of science and technology, they have to view it within a broader, uh, from a broader macro perspective and how, you know, programs like this impact uh, people's culture and people's beliefs. So I think that they are, I mean, they're scientists. So I think they are incrementally just becoming more aware and learning uh, how to contend with these kinds of situations. I think that they've made it a, Good, good faith attempts to do that. Do, do you think the way this issue has made uh, media, both locally and nationally and globally, has it helping to educate people about the its situation with Native Hawaiians? I think I think so. I think that um, you know, for for decades and decades, um, you know, Native Hawaiian beneficiaries in Hawaii have um, suffered in a lot of ways. Um, you know, as a result of, and I hate to say it, as a result of how the state government here has managed um, their concerns um, and their resources. And so this was, um, you know, I think that what happened at Mauna Kea was a culmination of that frustration. It was also a reflection of the next, this new generation that is rising now, um, you know, that will, that will, you know, stand up for their, for their principles and, and speak out. Do you think, um, in the end, when you get to the working group's final process, kind of the global standard is now free prior informed consent. Do you think that's where we'll end up? Yeah, I'm not really sure. Um, I've been really careful to not give any indication of where I think the commission should be headed. I really want 
the 15 members of that group to sort it out for themselves and um, and then propose a, a recommendation at the end of their process. Fair enough. Uh, let me ask you this. How has the pandemic changed this debate and actually things going on in the ground? Yeah, so, um, you know, during this pandemic, um, I feel that um, Hawaii residents, you know, because we uh, saw a sudden decrease in tourism and visitors, that I think over this pandemic, um, Hawaii residents have come to better appreciate um, you know, Hawaii, the natural resources, the community here, family and friends, um, and the need to preserve to preserve that. Because, you know, frankly speaking, I think we've kind of lost that, um, you know, prior to the pandemic. But the pandemic has refocused people here. I think they see the value of Hawaii and, you know, what, what we can do in the future. Well, you really see that in ordinary discussions when people will talk, say, about... Um... Standing Rock and say, North Dakota, we expect that. But then you get to Hawaii and people don't expect that at all. They, they wanna see um, kind of the civic discourse that we expect. I think so. And I think that they saw the, you know, the before and after of the, the loss of tourist visitors and they, they saw what an impact, you know, um, all of that buildup had within our, our community. So I think, you know, I would like to think that the pandemic has brought uh, Hawaii residents closer together. Outside of other, uh, outside of the state legislature, how are other entities in government um, approaching this? And are they partners in this? Uh, well, the House is working, uh, is taking the lead on this. The working group does have uh, representatives from several state agencies that have a, you know, do have a role in the astronomy program. So that's the University of Hawaii, uh, the Department of Land and Natural Resources, and the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. So they, each of those um, state organizations have a representative on our, on our committee. I, I'm curious, what makes you most optimistic about this as it unfolds? You know, I think, I actually feel that the community, the larger community wants to see some resolution on how we um, address this situation. I don't feel that the community wants uh, an issue like this to linger or to fester and to never be resolved. I think that I think that the public wants to see a resolution that will address all of the different concerns that have been raised. Um, I think they just they want us to help to help work this out. It's interesting because um, on one hand you have the ideals, but on the other hand, there's a structure in place here, and it kind of shows that on some of these really difficult issues, structure matters. Yeah, it does, and I think that's you know that's a lesson for state government. The way that this this program has been structured, you know, the Mauna Kea is public land, and it is a part of the um, public land trust in Hawaii. The Department of Land and Natural Resources. Uh, has a jurisdiction over the public land trust. So, you know, the bottom line is Mauna Kea is public land and uh, it is, uh, it does fall under the state government. And so it's incumbent upon state government to really figure out and to assess how it's gonna carry out its trust obligations, uh, not just for Mauna Kea, but for all public land in our state. I think that, you know, it's a good time for, for the state to just reassess its, uh, its practices. There's a great deal of interest in this and we'll continue to watch. Thank you, Speaker Psyche, for this. Uh... Hey, thanks, Mark, for having me today. A and we'll be right back. Last year, Haskell Indian Nations University President Ronald Graham issued directives that limit the Indian leaders' access to public officials and telling the news. The editor pushed back, and last month, Graham was fired. Jared Nolly, Editor-in-Chief of the Indian Leader, joins us today. Welcome, Jared. Hi, I'm Mark. So there's always a tension between any administration and um, a student newspaper but uh, you fought the good fight and kept pushing back and tell us the outcome. Um, 
well, just, I think it was a week, week ago, the BIE finally recognized um, not only my concerns, but Haskell Faculty Senate's concerns in the leadership of Graham and the state of free speech and expression on the campus. Uh, and he was removed from his position. Well, and I should mention that the Bureau of Indian Education is the BIE, and it is broader than just the free press issues because it was also uh, a directive that faculty members could not speak to you, basically, correct? Yeah, they couldn't speak to the Indian Leader or any other news outlet publications. Um, and some of the actions threatened the accreditation of the university as well. It's interesting if you go back well, more than a century and read the Indian Leader, uh, it, at that time, it really was the voice of the administration. And now it really is a freewheeling, independent thought, student-led news organization. Yeah, the history of the Indian Leader kind of started as a newsletter for Haskell administrators to uh, get the word out on what an Indian boarding school was doing and um, the success they were having with um, Native students. And as Haskell has changed over the century to serve the educational goals of Native communities, the press has also changed to uh, reflect the voice of the students rather than the administrators. Do, do you think your work in this area will make it um, more protection for uh, editors in the future? I have to think so. I look back at students um, in 1989 that also uh, had a legal battle with the school, and they set a precedent. Um, they established a settlement agreement that really builds on the foundation of the activism um, that I'm doing to establish free speech and expression on our campus. And uh, I have to think that with their role models and the, the impact that they're having on my work today, that that will be the same for students in the future, being able to build off of what the outcomes of this are. I think it's interesting that the issue, even for high school students, let alone college students across the country is already settled law. It's only the Bureau of Indian Education, in Indian Education that's recalcitrant in this area because it's not should not even be a close call. Yeah, we, I think historically just see the rights of Native Americans lag behind the rest of the population. Um, student free speech rights um, were really only recognized in 1969 with the Tinker Standard. Um, and so I think we're seeing that um, that buffer uh, in it making it to Indian country and recognizing that Haskell is a federal school that students retain these rights. Yeah, with the First Amendment, you'd think there'd be more rights, not less associated with student press. Absolutely. How, I mean, it's one thing to have the right, it's another thing to get the story. Uh, how do you think the administration has taken it from the point on about the, the win? Are they talking to you now? Um, currently, I haven't had a whole lot of communication with them. Since the, the change, they haven't even informed students directly that the president's been removed and that Tamara Pfeiffer um, is in her acting role as university president. And I think that really shows why a student press um, and local coverage is important because we broke that story. That's how our community knows. Um, and the students aren't finding out from our administration. So there is a real importance for the work we do. That's extraordinary. How, how about the faculty members that now have the right to speak up because of your work? We've gotten a lot of support with Haskell Faculty Senate. We recently did an event for graduation pairing with faculty um, due to the lack of initiative from the administration. Um, so there's been, I think, a, a good communication on that front with faculty. Let me ask this, um, as you go forward, what are kind of the challenges for the student press at Haskell? I think just set reestablishing that relationship with the administration um, and having the community understand the role of student press as a watchdog 
to university policies and uh, just the benefits that uh, encouraging free speech and free press has on the university. What stories are you working on now? <laughs> well, we just wrapped up with our spring semester. Um, and so I think we're looking into a few more um, like lifestyle pieces, some, some lighter news because with COVID-19, we really haven't had a chance to explore um, some of the other avenues, um, which been a struggle just to keep up with the day-to-day uh, -day, um, hard policies that students need to know. So, so has the paper been remote during this last year? We have. Um, in fact, most of our writers are in Lawrence uh, and that's been a challenge to struggle. Um, we have people everywhere from Alaska um, to uh, Oklahoma, so uh, pretty sparse. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for that was Jared Nolly, Editor-in-Chief of Haskell Universities, the Indian leader. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. Join us again tomorrow and online at IndianCountryToday.com. Thank you for watching. I'm Mark Trahan. Sometimes you got to take a stand just because you know you can oh, you got to run you got to run This is Indian Country Today.